Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the 8020 CS podcast. My name is Susan Odell. I'm founder and CEO of 8020 CS. And who are we? We're mentors. We focus on helping leaders succeed through complex change with a focus on operational improvement that drives up profitability. Uh, so if you want to learn more about 8020CS, please visit 8020CS.com. Uh, the 8020CS podcast is 100% focused on successful, successful change stories um, across a spectrum of industries. So we're going to have a focus on business, but also health and wellness and the creative arts, three areas that are really important to me, uh, to share insights that hopefully uh, will be beneficial to all of you. So today I'm pleased to welcome Gilles Villeneuve to, um, Gilles Villeneuve is one. <laughs> yeah, that's my, uh, that's my alter ego. It is, well, you know, you just do it on a bike, right, Gene? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think that that I'm I'm not going to suggest we re-record that because I think it's perfect. The the, the parallels are perfect. Um, it is. <laughs> uh, so, Gene, please welcome to the to the podcast and introduce yourself. And and I think that was a perfect uh, segue. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. No, it's it's great to be here. And you know what? Um, having last name Villeneuve and the first name Gene, my entire life. People have accidentally called me Jill uh, just because of the Formula One race car driver. Yeah. And having lived in France for nine years of my career, it's incredible how many French people know Gilles Villeneuve that are kind of 40 plus. Right. And how many times I've been referred to as that, like, you know, I'm getting up onto a stage or something. But it's, it's kind of neat because at it least is. I'm in a good category, right? It's a huge, <laughs> I mean, I remember I grew up watching F1 with my dad, like sitting beside him on the sofa watching the F1 <clears> races at the time. So you're right, the 40 plus crowd, crowd it's it's an automatic referral and, and a nice one to have. So uh, back to it you, to tell your <laughs> backstory. Yeah. 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 So my backstory, so I'm just, uh, is it I mean, almost 30 plus years now in uh, enterprise software uh, started right out of university in 94. Uh, I have a business degree from the University of Ottawa. Uh, it's now called the Telfer School of Management. Uh, but I really feel like my formative years came in the 90s and the early 2000s, uh, working with some incredible individuals. Uh, learning all different facets of the business from product management to product development to sales to marketing to sales support, um, but not necessarily just the like those specific domains as like isolated domain definitions, but more the sort of the soft skills around managing complex situations, uh, managing large deals, managing large expectations. Um, managing through tough times and big change. And I learned a ton working at Cognos in the 90s. Then I went to a small startup that was then acquired by Cognos' number one competitor called Business Objects. And then from there, I yes, grew into successfully larger roles within the enterprise software uh, landscape, uh, eventually coming back to Cognos before Cognos got acquired by IBM. And then from 2008 till 2014, I ran the uh, IBM Cognos Business Intelligence product line. And then in 2014, got an opportunity to go back to Europe. And then I switched careers still with IBM, but ended up getting into a sales management, sales leadership role, or as running like a fairly large sales team. Um, you know, maybe between the sellers, the pre-sales and the services organization, we're maybe 500 to 700 people in size. It was a large team. Then I moved back to Canada for various reasons um, and joined a startup. And uh, at first, it was a startup being incubated by a services company. We then spun that out of the services company and then grew it uh, in size until I decided to leave to focus on my own pursuits around advising organizations um, from bringing new product to market to sales to acquisition strategy. Um, and yeah, looking for the right product market fit. So that's kind of me in a nutshell. Uh, I'm currently advising one company out of Toronto right now, helping them find a strategic investor uh, for them. But otherwise, um, that's uh, that's what's on my plate right now. That's great. So it's fantastic to have you here because you know having a fellow veteran that's been been around for more than a few years. It's been through multiple M and A experiences um it's it's great to be able to share some uh some stories and war wounds and successes and and help people 
maybe avoid <laughs> some of the things we've seen and have to come in as fixers and, and help companies through and leaders through. So it's just a pleasure to have you today. Um, okay. I know one of the things we're going to talk about is specific to uh, an M&A uh, case uh, that was very intriguing and really interesting to hear the high level details, um, so many dimensions. Um, so give us a, a background uh, in terms of the story we're going to dive in today, into today. Yeah, so the, the short summary is that back in the early 2000s, Business Objects was looking to grow its footprint through acquisition uh, and market share through acquisition, but also trying to expand its portfolio to get into more what's called enterprise reporting at the time. Um, its number one competitor, Cognos, was just had just introduced the new product called Cognos ReportNet, um, and it was like taking the market by storm. Uh, so we looked at trying to acquire an organization to shore up that gap. But back then in the early 2000s, the market, this was the business intelligence market at the time, now called the analytics market, which is really around you know, extracting value out of data and trying to make sure that the organizations are empowered to make decisions or better decisions with that data. But what was also happening in parallel is the introduction of a category within the business intelligence line or the analytics line called performance management. And um, throughout this acquisition process, they realized that there was this gap that they were still going to have around this performance management dashboarding capability. Um, and that created a lot of uh, anxiety at the time within the business objects, crystal decisions, um, business or, or merger at the time. Can you just dig into performance management, what that definition was at the time? Yeah, so um, the traditional kind of business intelligence prior to um, sort of the early 2000s uh, era was more around just getting data into a report format so that people could look at monthly reports, weekly reports, quarterly reports. Uh, and some people were doing daily reports and like production runs, et cetera. Um, but as organizations were becoming more data savvy, they wanted to create dashboards and performance metrics. So um, they wanted to be able to create alerts. So for instance, like we know that we've got a revenue number or an inventory number or a gross margin number that we need to hit. And in order to be successful, we needed to find some, uh, what we call metrics. So a metric is not just the number, but it's, um, here's the number, but here's, what's the objective? Are we trending towards that objective? Yeah. Are, uh, and then what are all of the initiatives that we need to put in place? And can we track all of those initiatives? Um, around achieving that objective. So uh, the business intelligence category at the time uh, was more opti optimized around getting access to data sitting in um, rows and columns, sitting in structured databases. But there was this evolution to more of a performance management system around defining these metrics and all the characteristics around these metrics than having a hierarchy of these metrics. So here are the corporate goals, here are the strategic initiatives uh, around each organization or each part of the business. And then each part of the business will have their cascading set of goals. And then we need to assign um, owners to those goals and whether or not they're achieving their objectives. It could be revenue objectives, it could be like uh, marketing lead generation, could be conversion objectives, it could be financial objectives. So all of these need to somehow coalesce into a hierarchy so people could look at them in a dashboard and figure out what initiatives are working well or not working well. So this was a, a gap um, that business objects and crystal decisions coming together still didn't have a solution for, but many of the other competitors in the landscape um, were creating solutions and bringing those solutions to market. Um, so so I, I think that should answer your It totally does. And it's really fascinating because there's parallels to what you're talking about back in the 2000s around this leapfrog in, uh, in data, data um, representation and now getting to um, the, the KPIs metrics, right? right, around data and what's happening with AI today, right? So when we think about the maturity of data, uh, prescriptive uh, analytics, which is more advanced than predictive analytics, where we're at the next phase of data. But what you're talking about is this leapfrog in advancement around data back in the 2000s. So there's parallels to being like uh, kind of caught off guard. You think you're you're going to acquire one company to solve a gap, but then the gap expands, it changes, and evolves. Correct. And you have to respond yeah. to that. So I think it's a really relevant conversation to market conditions changing 
and absolutely and to respond to it so um yeah please continue yeah yeah so it was a fascinating time so so back in the 2004 2005 time period when i was working for uh, business objects i was in this odd role where um i had initially moved over to Europe to work for business objects in a combined product marketing, product management role. Um, but they decided to move product marketing to California and separate the two roles. So they'd have product management in Europe and product marketing in California. Um, and then in doing so, for some reason, I ended up being in the strategy role. And in the strategy role, um, I ended up working with the executive team on okay, what are the get what are the what does our current portfolio look like? It's more like a portfolio manager role, looking at what are their current uh, market demands uh, out there in the market, and what do we need to do to shore up those demands either through building or acquiring or partnering. Um, so I was, I wouldn't say I was instrumental in the business objects acquisition, but I certainly helped influence the decision, but I felt like I was more instrumental in the integration work of the Crystal Decisions uh, acquisition. Once it was made, to, which is huge, right? You do a deal, yeah. but if the deal isn't successful post, post deal, then you've got a big problem on your hands, right? Exactly, yeah. Um, and then while all this was happening, it, and, and it was like, like, to me, it was like one of these massive privileges. If I look back at my career, uh, you know, being first acquired by business objects, everything I learned in that transition, and then business objects acquiring crystal decisions for all intents and purposes was more of a merger. Yeah. Uh, and then the Cognos being acquired by IBM. Those were kind of three really phenomenal periods in my career where I learned so much about, you know, culture, personalities, uh, integration, um, and all the things one needs to do or not do <laughs> around making things successful around integration. So in this role, um, once the acquisition, well, well throughout, throughout the entire sort of acquisition and integration period, this lack of dashboarding and performance management skills or capabilities as part of the portfolio was becoming more of a, um, a, an issue of tension within the business. Um, and you know, we are getting more and more feedback from the sellers and more and more feedback from the pre-sales teams that, you know, they could create these really unique dashboards through the reports, but they weren't dynamic. They weren't responsive. People couldn't drill on them properly, et cetera. They couldn't define comparisons between the current metric and the targets. And it was really hard for them to do all of that. Um, so interestingly, business objects uh, before the acquisition had started this uh team that was creating content, so templates, um, to create reporting templates for specific industry solutions. Yeah. Um, and then Crystal Decisions had a team that was working on a sorry, multi-dimensional database kind of solution, but that solution had never really hit the market well. Um, and that team and that product was probably end of life. Um, so one of the things that I did in terms this, of the in, performance, in terms of the performance numbers in market, like it, it just yeah, it performance numbers in market. Uh, you had a small market share. It didn't have the feature set uh, to compete, and neither did it have the go-to-market strategy around it to compete. Um, and it was based on a fairly old technology that wasn't. I mean, it was actually a scalable technology, but it wasn't. It was really tough to implement. It wasn't like an easy solution for somebody to implement as part of a, a larger enterprise data strategy. So the writing um, was, was on the wall, but not people hadn't necessarily read it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so one of the things that I did, and this is one of the things I love about product management, is because you're because because when you're in product management, you're sort of like at the intersection of like the business. Like you you know what's happening competitively. You know what the market analysts are saying. You're hearing the feedback from sellers. You're hearing the feedback from partners. And there's a lot of anxiety from the exec team around, okay, well, we need to build out a portfolio strategy around how do we expand our, our, our company and how do we keep growing and like, you know, selling into our base, but also acquiring new customers and competing and like increasing the overall value for the stakeholders of the business. Yeah. So, um, which I love that role. So one of the things I did as part of that integration period is I did a lot of analysis of the performance management market. I looked at uh, you know all the various tools out there in the market at the time, uh, what all the competitors were doing, and spoke with a lot of customers, uh, the customer advisory boards that Business Objects had set up, and you know just surveyed them on what they would require. Um, so throughout that whole survey process, I ended up defining a list of 
Yeah, you know, we call it like an MVP today. I don't, I don't think it, back then we were using that language, like minimum viable product or market viable product. We were just saying, like, in order for us to compete and be successful, here's the set of features we need in release one, release two, release three, release four, yeah. right? Um, so Are you waking put, up? We, we didn't use MVP back then? I don't think so. Like there are a lot of terms that we use nowadays that I don't think we use. Like let's think yeah. like the entire SaaS business, right? Like, right. like, like net dollar retention. If I said that like back in 2003, yeah. uh, nobody would know what I'm talking about, right? Net present value, those types of things, right? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. Well, those, those words are still being used back then, but yeah. I don't think uh, like net dollar retention was being used, but I, I know that customer churn was being used a lot back then. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, it was really fun because I was able to define, okay, this is what the market requires. And I did an analysis of kind of what we had as not only uh, feature sets between the two different organizations, but also team viability and team aptitude around the ability to shore up these gaps. So the team that was previously building these industry solutions out of California and the team that was on this older solution um, that was end of life from Crystal Decisions was actually based in Ipswich, um, England, which is interesting. So yeah. uh, so we were able to um, put together a proposal. I remember specifically, that, you know, in, in the, the preamble to this meeting, I remember specifically um, going to a fairly challenging exec meeting um, in one of the boardrooms in Paris. It was actually La Valois Paris, which is a, a little um, city on the attached to Paris because that's where the business objects uh, headquarters were at the time. And the CEO was in the room, uh, the SVP of marketing was in the room, the SVP of engineering was in the room, and a bunch of other people were also there too. And I put this proposal together that said, look, you know, what we need to do is build out a roadmap that looks as follows. I won't go through the details for the podcast, but I said, here's what that roadmap looks like. And what I need to do is take this team and that team, merge them together in order to create these two add-on modules. One was called Dashboard Manager. The other one was called Performance Manager. And um, and then we would build out a longer-term solution around the ability to create these cascading um, performance metrics that you could then assign initiatives to, et cetera. Um, but I remember you know, because I remember the tension in the room, and this is where I think you, you chuckled at. Yeah. Because um, I say, look, you know, you've got this one product, which is called Application Foundation at the time. Um, I think it was called that. Yeah. Um, and and I said, look, you know, this, this product, which we all know isn't really selling in the market. Um, you know, you've got maybe a million dollars in sales every quarter, and the customers are not really using it. Um, so I said, look, that product, you know, I, you know, I'm going to say that, you know, for the next two or three quarters, you know, revenue is either going to go to zero or it's going to falter um, until we fix these features and bring these new. And I remember, like, it's really hard. Like, 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 like executives hate when you tell them, oh, this product line, we're going to reduce revenue until we bring it back up. Right. They, yeah. they just, there's just something fundamental about how people are trained in business that they do not like being told that a product line is going to like take a, a backseat to revenue while you kind of uh, focus on bringing it back to a yeah. state that will be successful. It's an auto, so, it's an auto response to no, it is. that's just not, not acceptable. And just for the podcast audience, the, the product you're talking about was part of the acquisition portfolio. It was not part of your core portfolio. Well, it was, there were two products at the time, right? There was the old product the, from Crystal Decisions, what they, where Crystal had already decided they were going to end of life this product and okay. that they were putting an end of life. But then this other capability was a, was a bit of a pet project of the CEO um, from Cog, uh, sorry, from Business Object at the time. Um, and he believed that, you know, the future was these, um, uh, these templates and these solutions that were predefined for customers out of the box. Um, and we never really let go of that capability because the business objects still wanted to create these templates that, that never really went anywhere because we were really selling a platform right. and a generic set of tools. Yeah. Um, but so, so that was hard to convince them that this capability that wasn't really going anywhere, sales were faltered, um, 
to, to say, look, you know, that team, we need to redeploy them to create the dashboard manager, performance manager, performance managers, uh, products. Uh, I remember specifically like the room got kind of like the dynamics of the room were, were fascinating because uh, I, like I put my career on the line. I said, look, you know, I, I believe so strongly in this that if in six to 12 months, we don't turn the revenue around, you could fire me, right? And I said that in the room, Absolutely. <laughs> right? And, and I was, you know, mid thirties, early thirties at the time. Like, you know what? Uh, you know, I probably had a bigger ego then than I do now. <laughs> and and uh, I was, I, I felt so strongly about this that, that we were going to do the right thing um, by by doing uh, by following the strategy. And I remember, like you know, the SVP of marketing kind of moving away from me in the in the room. Physically, <laughs> physically, <laughs> physically, yeah. And I remember the CEO being like, you know, pretty distraught. And um, but amazingly, though, even though these people kind of moved away from me in the room, etc., um, I had done enough pre work. Um, and enough of a business case justification uh, that it wasn't just, you know, fist pounding and uh. passion, right? It was based on facts. It was, here's what all the other competitors are doing. Here's what that feature set needs to look like. Um, here's how much revenue I believe that we could get in six months with this feature and in 12 months with this feature, et cetera, et cetera. And I kind of walked them through the plan. And I said, now here's what the team needs to look like in order to build it. Yeah. So out of that meeting, we ended up defining a leader on the engineering team, a leader for QA, a leader for the program management team. And then I was leading the product management team out of that. Um, and we were given the mission to go ahead and build this team, uh, which was which was really fun because um, it, it was probably one of the, if I look back to my career, I mean, there's lots of really fun things in my career, but but that was like a phenomenal time because I was traveling to California, to Vancouver, to Ipswich, to Paris, uh, trying to build this team, trying to get everybody aligned. Uh, and it was it was fascinating, right? Just building momentum, the excitement, the energy, uh, the joy that the team had in, in building out these solutions. Um, and even though I think I was seen as the spiritual leader, but there's just no way I was able to do this alone. Like there are guys that like friend Daniel, who is the performance, he was the leader, the engineering leader, my primary partner, um, somebody that I still hold in high regard. Uh, he's, he's French, uh, awesome, awesome guy. Um, without him and without the support of like Dave Kellogg and Hervé Couturier, um, you know, senior leaders in the business yeah. and Ryan Wong, who's now the CEO of this year, uh, without the support of these senior execs within the business objects, Crystal Decisions merger, there's no way we would have been successful. And so, every time we have, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. go ahead. I just finished your thought. And then I want to go back and dig into a couple of things around the, sort okay. of the human dynamic and some of the things yeah. that you did uh, in order to build the case and, and soften the ground for that board, yeah. board room meeting. So, yeah, all I was going to say is that just, just by having the support of all those individuals is that every time we came into a roadblock, uh, be it access to resources or culture or whatever, these guys, um, you know, were, were instrumental in, in helping. Um, you know, I, it, and by the way, there's one other person, too, that was also very instrumental, uh, Tracy Eiler, who is our marketing lead, uh, global marketing lead. And she knew we needed to close this gap. So she was like a big champion as well. She would also uh, help support in this cause, too. Yeah. OK, so let, let's go back and talk about a few things Like you, you hit one. So 8020 CS for for the audience uh, stands for something. 8020 is the Pareto principle. So 80% right. of out, outputs are based on 20% of inputs negative or positively. C stands for core, which is confidence, openness, resiliency, and effort. And S stands for strength, the measure of that. So you, your confidence, let's talk about that for a minute, your confidence uh, to put your job on the line. And I've done mm -hmm. that as well multiple times to say, look, uh, you know, based on my experience and what I've seen and, and, the, and the homework I've done, if we don't do this thing, um, you know, which we need to do, I'm, I, you know, I won't be here any longer because we'll have right. failed on a macro level, right? So your confidence, because you did the work is hugely important. And I think, I think that's an important mes message to get across. But can you talk about um, the socialization of your vision and your plan before that boardroom meeting, 
and then just dig into a little bit uh, the, the combination of um, bringing people on side ahead of that meeting, you know, even if they weren't fully there, but doing that human uh, work as well as the actual business case work. Yeah. Um, so I think I was very fortunate at the time to work with guys like Dave Kellogg, Crispin Reed, names that won't mean anything to your podcast uh, listeners, uh, and Ryan Wong and them. But they they were like like one of the things that I always prided myself in within my career is just trying to be really um, like a strong listener, but also focus on facts and genuinely sort of kind in my approach to working with individuals. Um, and never kind of, you know, always trying to bring decision making back to you know, like facts and opportunities, um, as opposed to many people I've worked with in my career that it's all about like gut and egos. And 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 I think by always approaching my relationships with my colleagues around like what can I do for you? How can we solve this problem together? It's us against the world. It's not us against each other. Um, it was always like that was always my approach when I was working with call and still is today. It's like, you know, how can we work together to solve this problem? Um, and so, so that was like kind of one aspect of the, the dynamic, but um, luckily the, the team I was working with at the time um, was very supportive in giving me the rope to go do this analysis. So um, one of the things that, um, the combined sort of company had created was a sort of weekly st strategy review. And the weekly strategy review gave me an opportunity to review initiatives with the executives yeah. and slowly build buy-in, right, with the engineering team, the executives, and those that were coming to this this virtual sort of table, so to speak, uh, because it was, it was because of the time zone difference. It always happened around five or six o'clock at night in okay. Paris because I was in Paris, and then Vancouver was just kind of waking up at the time. Right. Um, and there were two or three hour meetings, and we had the execs in the meeting from California, from Vancouver, from Paris, and from England. Uh, and we use those opportunities to weekly review strategic initiatives, either the product that's going to be shipping in three months or in six months, or new initiatives that people are bringing to 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 the board. Um, so I use that as an opportunity to build momentum and support for this initiative. But behind the scenes, though, um, I was also working, uh, you know, with my managers um, and the senior leaders in one-on-one -on -one meetings or um, other meetings where I'd bring in some of the other supporters to walk them through um, you know the gaps that we currently have around this performance management category. But but just to be clear though, um, luckily at the time, most people at the table, um, and I mean the virtual table across the company yeah. understood that this gap was growing, right? Because they were hearing it from the sales teams and they understood that this gap was growing. However, how we solved it was very different, right? Everybody had their opinion as to who should be the leader, how we should be doing it, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So that, I mean, you're raising a good point. And I think it's it's really important that you know what what we're focused on as a company is is leadership that recognizes a need or yeah. recognizes a problem and they're actually their their problem is that they're stuck and they don't necessarily have the solution they're looking for um a, a, a business case they can get behind to take that risk to actually attack the problem so that's great but you said m most not all so you still had to deal with um uh individuals and personalities that, that might maybe didn't have the same um desire for collaboration at all costs, maybe had their own political uh, agendas that you had to navigate, I'm assuming? Yeah, correct. Like, um, we don't want to name names, but um, but they're like, for instance, like the previous leaders of that team in California, um, you know, they had some major concerns around, well, you know, Gene is basically proposing that we end of life this right. team and redeploy them to this other opportunity. Um, so that took a lot of um, like internal politicking, and I really just needed support from the senior execs at the time to make a decision, um, and you know that would impact that team. Um, 
but the the interesting thing is that like the, the leader of that team at the time i don't think that person was on board but the folks working for that person were really excited about this change because um they understood the opportunity and yeah. they understood the direction um and like 12 months after i mean they're thrilled because uh haven't mentioned this yet but like the product that we the products that we brought to market dashboard manager performance manager um you know you probably can't quote me in these exact figures but like in the first two quarters we knew we'd make almost no revenue at all uh, but we were building lots of sales momentum and excitement, creating all the sales tools, the collateral, the demos, et cetera. Um, and the sales team was getting excited. And we ended up launching it in, I think, Q4 of that year. Uh, ended up doing really well, like I think maybe $5 million in revenue as an add-on. And yeah. then in the in the following 12 months, the product, I think, grew like about $50 million in revenue is what it contributed to the total revenue line. Um, and that... It was a, because of the way we built it, we knew that if we built it as an add on to the current technology, um, and we already had a fairly large customer base yeah. that you could sell it. Uh, and, and sellers absolutely love being able to go back to customers and selling them <laughs> new capabilities because you already have the relationship, you already have the purchasing process in order. Um, you know, they're already using the technology. It just becomes a no brainer kind of add on, right? Um, and then also when they're competing against, um, the other competitors in the market, having this new capability as part of the portfolio, made them a lot more attractive and able to compete and win larger deals. So, um, and that created so much momentum and excitement within the business. Uh, and people were really thrilled by that. Um, and career-wise, it helped me uh, a lot as well um, within business objects. And I ended up in 2006 getting a promotion to uh, a VP role as well as a result of like being the director around this business. Um, so in or, your business case, you, yeah. you forecasted the, the hockey stick. Um, I did. I didn't, I didn't like, I don't think I got that ambitious in the forecast. Like I didn't think like personally, I didn't think it was going to be that successful, but it ended up becoming a lot more successful than I thought it would be. Was there um, some degree of a hockey stick that you, you put into if we did? Yes, I did. I did. Okay. I did believe that there would be a hockey stick. Yeah. I didn't think it would be, I thought maybe 5 million the first year, maybe 25 million the second year, yeah. uh, but ended up being closer to 50 million the second year. Yeah. Well, we're Canadian. So we say hockey stick in other parts of the world, yeah. maybe it's a lacrosse stick or, or some <laughs> other, <laughs> some other yeah. analogy, but, but basically you believed in the case so much that you, you said, if we do this, we're absolutely uh, and making a key decision to mine the base, right? This was a strategy yeah. of growth focused on on mining the existing customer base. That it was a it was not unreasonable to forecast uh, significant growth if we do it right. Correct. Yeah, and the market conditions, like globally at that time, like two thousand four, two thousand five, um, you know, we were kind of post the two thousand and three kind of market meltdowns. Um, yeah. And the markets were kind of like recapitalizing and like the global economy was growing uh, yeah. significantly. Um, so, yeah, there was there was a lot of growth um, happening. And I think like growth, like for business objects was like in the 20 plus percentage periods at the time. Um, so. So, yeah, so for had to have this product grow in the 100 percent category plus plus um, was probably not to be. We, we should have expected that, right? Yeah, Anything less than that would have been failure. Yeah. Well, that's it. So a couple of things I just want to highlight from what you said earlier, you know, you, you had the strategy meetings weekly and in parallel, you had your one-on-one -on -one meeting, one -on -one meetings as well. So continuing to collaborate and, and, um, and educate and, and uh, bring people alongside to gather that buy-in. So that's just for, for the, um, the audience of uh, the listeners and watchers of the podcast. It's really important that you do those same things. If you don't have that official uh, cadence of regular check-ins as a team, something you should think about implementing and in parallel to the one-on-one -on -one conversations, because those are very different than when you have everybody around a table where they're, they're in more of a defensive posture and protecting territory. So that's one thing I wanted to talk about. Um, the other thing is, can you, can you talk about timing? So from your initial collective, everybody saying, yeah, you know, there's a gap, there's this expanded gap in our product line to that board meeting. Uh, that's sort of like phase one of time timeline. And then phase two would be sort of first indicators of the hockey stick. 
um, hitting yeah. market. Um, can you share a little bit of, around time? Because the reason I want to bring this up is um, success like you're talking about, successful change, this is not an overnight thing. It takes time. Um, it takes a lot of effort and time. So I wonder if you could put a timeline around around yeah, that. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think the, I can't remember the exact precise years, either 2003 or 2004 when the Crystal Decisions acquisition happened. Um, but it was that year, I think it was 2004. It was that year um, when we did the integration and we identified this gap. Um, so it was early enough in the year, I think it was like maybe May, June, um, when we identified this gap and then just made all the decisions around reconstituting the team yeah. um, and then building the project plan. And it wasn't until I think December of that year when we brought the product to market, which was then sold as an add-on um, to our existing customers, both the, yeah. both the crystal decisions and the business objects customers. And then it was 2005, uh, where we saw the hockey stick happen. Yeah. So that's 18 months. So, you know, yeah. in, in my, my book that will be coming out in the fall, I talk about your six to 18 months minimum, uh, yes. talking about successful change because you've got the business case process, you've got de defining what your change path is going to be bringing everybody on site. And then there's execution. And, and if you're doing well, if you're on track, it's six to 18 months. If you're not, it could be longer than that. Um, so that's just another example of that, that pretty standard timeline for, for change. Yeah. And it's, yeah. And it's also just time to build a product too, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, it depends on what it is you're trying to change. If it's like a sales strategy, sometimes a sales strategy could have a shorter ROI, but mm -hmm. if you've already got the assets and all the other conditions for success, right? But in this case here, the primary element or ingredient that was missing for the success was the product. And, um, but the biggest challenge was just trying to get the team together to align on the product vision and then how we're going to execute on it. And luckily, um, the work that I had done at the highest level, um, you know, help set the stage, but really it's the, the team, like the program managers, the engineers that uh, blew everyone away with their creativity and their uh, eagerness and their energy. And yeah. and it was incredible too, because like I've worked a lot of startups, but this was like a startup within a big organization. And the team right. was so excited and so energized about the solution and the vision that like, you know, because the team was scattered between Vancouver and uh, Ipswich and Paris and and, um, and and California, I think we had some folks in India too doing uh, QA. Uh, it felt like it was a 24-7 development initiative where like, you know, I could work 24-7, you know, dealing with internal issues or external yeah. issues. And it was, it was fun. It was a really fun time. And it sounds like you didn't have any product engineering distractions because it was a startup within a big company. So, you know, Correct. sometimes when you have features that you need to be developed within a, an existing GA product, uh, and then an, uh, a deal is won and, and now you're delayed on this feature that you need because you got to deliver a new feature for a big client, right? That typical, yeah. it sounds like you didn't have any of that distraction due to well, the not in not in the first six to 12 not in the first six to 12 months but i think i think by the end of 20 2005 we were probably starting to get more and more kind of feature requests from the right. early adopters that yeah. needed yeah. that were either stuck on a deployment because you know it wasn't scaling properly or there was yeah. a visualization that they're missing or something like that yeah Okay, uh, one other element I wanted to touch on, and it's, uh, you know, I like to talk about grit a lot, and I'm not sure if that's that's the right word to use in this case or not, but there is always non-believers and detractors when you're trying to do something bold and big and ambitious. And I'm just wondering if you had that experience through this uh, this this journey uh, with Business Objects and Crystal Reports. And, and if you did, uh, how did you, how did you, you know, kind of continue and sustain your path through through the non-believers, if there were any. Yeah. Um, well, I think. Well, I think one of the things that we we did as a team to ensure that everybody was aligned um, was that within that team that was creating this this add-on feature set around dashboard manager and performance manager, um, we made sure that the entire team was constantly 
educated on the vision and there was always communication on what we needed to do. Um, so that's part one. And then part two, you know, the rest of the organization, um, there, there's all sorts of politics. Like when you've got two kind of companies coming together, yeah. uh, you know, and they're of similar sizes. You've got like this person was running that large engineering team in, yeah. in Crystal Decisions. And this person was running that large engineering team at Business Objects. Um, you know, all sorts of the politics around, well, who's going to be the winner at the, when everything kind of fakes out, right? right. Um, we're not going to name names, but it was interesting to see kind of all that happen kind of around me. And luckily, because we had constituted this as a, a new team with a combination of the former uh, business objects and former crystal decisions coming together as one uh, with a new mandate, new mission, um, within the team, it was a very well- I mean, everybody coalesced well around that vision, um, but I often saw, you know, around me, like this this political fighting around who's going to win what, right? Um, it, so that's part one. And the part two is we were executing, like we were hitting our milestones, we were delivering uh, and bringing things to market. Um, you know, it was quite a while ago now, so I, I'm sure that there are some instances where things were were not working. Um, and we got some pushback and some non-believers. But I think, you know, even if I think of recent uh, initiatives, yeah. for me, it's always around, you know, what is it we're trying to accomplish as a team? And, like, do we feel, not feeling feeling, but factual feelings on, right. like, do we support the fact. Do we believe in the, in the, in the case? Right. Yeah, do we believe in the case, right? And if there's ever an issue of, hey, you know, I don't believe in this anymore, let's just go back to the case. And right. does the case still, um, you know, have viability? Is it still valid? Can we still execute on this? And is it still going to move the needle for us? Yeah. So that's where we always like, like went back to to that, right? That was always um, that was always how I think I addressed any non-believers within yeah. uh, pragmatism. Within Go back yeah. to the facts and uh, come together or collaborate around the facts. And if something isn't making sense, you collaborate around working through it until it does. And if it yeah. doesn't make sense, then you've got the question of of failing fast in the current idea and and moving to another idea. But it's just an ongoing conversation. I think definitely the theme of uh, communication transparency is is very consistent for you. So this has been a, a fantastic um, success uh, su successful change story. Thank you for coming on today and and sharing your thoughts. I want to wrap up with something else I know is dear to your heart, and that's health and wellness. And if yes. you can share your your thoughts on on the value of health and wellness in your professional career and and in your life, I just think that would be a, just a great while we have you to just share share your thoughts on that. Uh, great. Yeah. Uh, let me kind of put this together. So, um, as you know, I've always been an endurance athlete. Yeah. Um, and for me, the endurance sports have always been a way for me to, um, almost calibrate my, or recalibrate my emotional and physical state. So, um, you may not come across, but I'm, I'm, I'm really more of an introvert in the sense that like I'm very methodical, very analytical. I like to kind of plan things out and like, you know, dot the I's, cross the T's, create the bullet list. Um, and then all of these instances where I need to be like this political actor, get this person to work with that person and then to go manage this team. I just find myself like completely exhausted by the end of the day, emotionally exhausted. So um, the way I recharge and take care of myself is by escaping into endurance activities. So it's either cycling or running. Uh, more recently, a lot of cycling. Uh, but it helps me kind of work through either issues of just exhaustion, like emotional exhaustion, yes. or, or uh, frustration, or um, ego checks, like, you know, often... I'll do something and think, oh, damn, what did I do that? And then I'll just like, beat myself up for it and then like go for a bike ride. It's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. You know what? I'm human. And I hope that person recognizes that I'm human too. Right. At the end of the day, we realize that 
we're just two people trying to get through the world together and like you know we could forgive and move on or whatever right so but it might be like something really small that i'm beating myself up about that the other person was not even aware of aware of right it's self, <laughs> yeah. self-inflicted uh self-inflicted yeah. right so <laughs> um so yeah so i just need those things to kind of but i just need to do that in order for me to feel like i could contribute 100 percent again back in my family and at work right because otherwise if i don't get that opportunity to kind of go recharge um you know by running or cycling then it undermines my ability to perform in other levels uh, yeah, and other facets of my life. Your person, everything else, 100%. I did not know you were an introvert. I am as well, which is very, we both had long sales careers. <laughs> yeah. but, um, similar, similar for me, it's strength training and like whole body fitness training. But, uh, you know, the, this, the bike is not for me, but it's, it's for the same reasons. You always feel so much better. Uh, 10 minutes into the workout and certainly after the workout, it, it does recalibrate your sense of, of wellness. So um, I think we're out of time, but this has been fantastic. I keep, could keep talking and uh, I'd love to have you back potentially on with uh, with Rennie, the personal trainer to talk about health and wellness. That would be great. Yeah, that would be fantastic. I think it'd be a fun conversation. Um, so everyone, thanks for, for watching today. Um, you can visit uh, 8020cs.com and there are more pod podcasts on on the site, um, reach out to me, fixer at 8020cs.com. Love to have a conversation with you around successful change and uh, lots more insights to share with you in the future. So Jean, AKA Jill, <laughs> it's, yeah. been a, it's been a pleasure and uh, we'll, we'll see you soon. Great, thanks Sue. Okay. It's been a, a pleasure time. to be on as well. Thank you so I'm much welcome. for having me. Thank you, bye. Thanks. Bye.